Hello, it's Dr. Daystorms once again, and now we're going to be discussing the periodic table and some of the characteristics of the periodic table. First, I have to apologize that this picture is a little outdated because there are now additional um, elements that have been added to the periodic table that have been named and added to the periodic table. However, I like the simplicity of the color scheme that they use here. I will show you an updated version in a moment. I apologize as I open up my can of Diet Mountain Dew. Okay, the periodic table is just a systematic way of showing the elements, and they're arranged in the order of their atomic number. In there, you can go back and look through the history of all the various um, uh, various versions of the periodic table before they settled upon this one. And it's really interesting. But one thing that they did notice was that there seemed to be a repeating pattern to the reactivities and the, the properties of these atoms. So, for example, here, if you started off with you know, with hydrogen, and then came helium. You had lithium. Lithium was a soft, very reactive metal, whereas helium was a non-reactive gas. Then, eight later, they noticed that there was neon. It's a non-reactive gas, but sodium was a soft, reactive metal. Then, later, there was argon was a non-reactive gas, whereas potassium was a soft, reactive metal, so on and so forth. And so they started to line these up, and that's how they they found this periodicity, and they called it the periodic table. So the rows on the periodic table are called periods, and the columns are called groups. Sometimes, and I do this myself as well, is not only do we call them groups, but we call them families. Uh, really nice. So for example, and I'm jumping the gun a little bit, but here, this group 8A is known as, it's a family that's known as the noble gases. It's also called, by some people, the inert gases, because erroneously they thought that they had no chemical reactivity whatsoever, but you'll find out later on that some of them really do have uh, a, a different type of reactivity. So they're often called the noble gases. Okay? But the, the elements that are in the same family typically have very similar chemical properties. So, for example, everything in this family here, you'll find out has very specific properties. In fact, in, or, in organic chemistry next year, you're going to use the, the, this family. So they're called the halogens a lot. Okay. This is the updated periodic table I just wanted to show you because, as I mentioned before, it does contain additional... Uh, elements, for example, that have been more recently discovered or named. For example, there's fluorovium down here, livermorium, so on and so forth. All periodic tables should give you a key or a legend. Well, this one shows you that it has its symbol, the name, the average atomic mass, and the atomic number. So, for example, from the last video that, that you, we, sh we went through, this is chlorine. Chlorine has the atomic number of 17, but the average atomic mass of 35.45. We're going to come back to this, to this periodic table in a moment. Okay, as I mentioned, there were some groups that have special names, or some families that have special names. Now, I want you to know group 1A, that first column is called the alkali metals. Group 2A, the second column, for example, magnesium and calcium, they're the alkaline earth metals. 6A, which is oxygen, sulfur, selenium, and so on and so forth. There are the chalcogens, 7A, the halogens, and then the noble gases are in 8A. I'm reverting back to the simplistic periodic table because of the fact that I like the way that they have it structured. Uh, we have, for example, here... With the exception of hydrogen, these elements, and they're always on the right-hand side of the periodic table, are called the nonmetals. And we're going to find out that nonmetals have certain 
very specific types of characteristics. Like, for example, most nonmetals, in fact, especially the halogens and the chalcogens, they like to gain electrons. And we'll talk about the reasons why later on. Then we have what's called the metalloids, which if you draw a little, whoops, if you draw a little stair step, Every, every element that touches the stair step on two sides, except for aluminum and polonium, those are called metalloids, because they're going to have characteristics of both metals and nonmetals. Polonium and aluminum are both metals. Okay, but boron, silicon, germanium, arsenic, tellurium, so on and so forth, those are the metalloids. And finally, we have everything else, which is the vast majority of the periodic table. Everything else, including aluminum and polonium, those are called metals. So I'd like to go back to this one, just to go and show you how this one's very in-depth, in that it also shows you a little bit more. So we have the metalloids. The halogens, these are the chalcogens, the noble gases, the alkali metals, alkaline earth metals. But if you notice here, we have all of these that's in this light color. Those are the transition metals. Okay, and we're going to find out that they have many different oxidation states, which at this point in time you probably don't know what that term means, but you will by the end of the semester. So, I hope that this has helped you. Oh, and then finally, we have what's called the lanthanoids or the lanthanides, and the actinoids or actinides. And they, I mean, for those of us who are colorblind, it's kind of difficult to tell, but they are inserted right there in the periodic table. So I hope that this has helped you just learn a little bit about the periodic table, about the different families in the periodic table, and just how to read the differences of where the metals, metalloids, and nonmetals are located on the periodic table.